We're gonna give folks we're gonna give folks about another minute to come in from the waiting room and then we'll begin. What did you say? Nothing. Good morning. I'm Sally Deck, and this is the 2023-2025 Future Ready Oregon Youth Grants RFA Information Session. A couple of quick things. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted online. We ask you to please mute your audio. You have the option of keeping your video on or turning it off. It's a problem either way. And you'll have the opportunity to enter any questions that surface as the presentation goes on in the Zoom chat. Our chat will be monitored um by some of our staff and we'll take breaks throughout the presentation to be able to answer the questions so just a quick overview i'm going to do a welcome um we're going to do some introductions of our staff i'll do a background of future ready oregon talk a little bit about the overview of the grant kind of what the evaluations look like and then we'll have time for a q a so during this information session, again, please be muted and enter questions in the chat. We'll be monitoring those. And then any questions that come up that are either too complex for us to cover during this presentation or that need any additional research on our part, as well as questions that come in after this presentation, will all be compiled and published in a question and answer document that will be published and posted on our website by about April 12th. So you have some time yet to submit questions. We'll be taking questions until about the 7th, excuse me, 5th of April. And then those will, the answers will all be posted by April 12th. So a quick welcome. Um, again, I'm Sally Deck and I am the YDO Future Ready Youth Program Analyst. And I will pass it to my team for them to introduce themselves. Good morning, everyone. Molly Burns, YDO Reengagement Grants Manager. Good morning, everyone. Melissa Gallardo, I am the Executive Support Specialist for YDO. Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Cord Buker, and I'm the Deputy Director for the Youth Development Division and Youth Development Oregon. Morning, everyone. My name is Jared Shaw, and I am a grant manager and workforce policy analyst with YDO. Good morning, Bill Hansel, uh, youth um, policy and operations analyst. Good morning. I'm uh, Abraham Magana. I'm the youth community grants uh, manager. Good morning. I'm Jessica Solano. I'm the administrative specialist. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bethany Moreland. I'm the OD Procurement Specialist associated with this RFA. I think I'm next. Uh, good morning, everybody. Brian Detman, Youth Development Director, Agency Director, just 
I'm only on for a, another second or two. Really appreciate all of you in attendance. Um, hope you find this information session really helpful and I get some good questions um, into the chat so that we can work on those. And many thanks, deep thanks to staff. I know Sally's gonna facilitate today's session, but you see all the names on this slide here in front of you. You've all put in a lot of work on this request for application process for this uh, for these grants and in other areas. So just a deep appreciation to the team for all the hard work. And again, I'm gonna sign off. Um, I hope you have a great session this morning. Um, uh, thanks for being here. All right, thanks, Brian. Um, <clears throat> my name is Paul Sell. I'm the YDO Youth Grants and Reengagement Systems Manager. I'll also be the one, uh, along with several of our other team members, monitoring the chat behind the scenes. So you'll see me periodically throughout the presentation. And as Sally said, just please do submit your questions in the chat. We won't be responding in the chat. Um, we will respond at different breaks throughout uh, that side. So with that, I'll turn it back to Cord. All right, everybody. So before we get into the presentation, one thing that we wanted to talk about is the governor's priorities uh, that were announced for her uh, budget, recommended budget for 2023 through 25. Um, because we wanted to get this application out earlier than we usually do, we started work back in the fall, and this stuff isn't really reflected in our RFA, but we wanted to talk about it here this morning um, just to provide some context. So Governor Kotek identified three priorities for her administration, building more housing and reducing homelessness, improving access to mental and behavioral health services and addiction services, and improving outcomes in early literacy and in K-12 schools. So all three of these areas, education outcomes in particular, are things that have been the focus of YDD grant program work, uh, but we wanna acknowledge and call attention to these priorities today. Applicants are not required to address these priorities, but you're encouraged to consider where and how your programs and services are aligned with them. Addressing and reducing youth homelessness, <clears throat> excuse me, improving access to mental health and addiction services for young people, and improving educational engagement and success are all things that you can address with these grants. Um, Future Ready is more specifically focused on workforce programs, and, and you'll learn more in detail about that. But um, all of these areas of support can be connected with that. Um, they can be aspects of the work. They can be a focus of it um, alongside, of course, the, the workforce uh, readiness programming. Um, around homelessness in particular, Governor Kotek issued an executive order that directs state agencies to prioritize reducing and preventing homelessness. And so this RFA is not restricted to serving youth who are experiencing homelessness uh, or specifically designed to deliver these services. But we wanna point out that there's a lot of flexibility in how YDD funding may be used to serve youth. And historically, um, our grantees have implemented a lot of different approaches to supporting young people experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness um, and, and addressing less visible issues such as housing instability and couch surfing and um, things of that nature. So whether your organization's mission is providing shelter or other services to youth experiencing homelessness, or you're just thinking about how you can better reach and retain young people who are um, experiencing this stuff, we want to encourage you to apply to support these efforts. So if you're thinking about how you would use these grant funds to address homelessness in the context of workforce development, and you're not sure if a um, you know, specific funding use is acceptable, please ask. Our goal is to remove policy barriers to reducing and preventing homelessness whenever possible. So I just wanted to uh, just say that up front, you're not going to see that specifically addressed in the RFA, but given that these have been identified as priorities for the administration, we wanna to speak to that today. So with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Sally to continue the presentation. Great. Thank you, Cord. All right. We are going to get started with some burning questions. These are questions that have come up really commonly and frequently. Um, so we want to make sure that these are addressed right away. So RFAs are open from now until the 1st of May at 5 p.m. We strongly encourage you to submit your application before that Monday, May 1st deadline in case there are any snafus with the technology or questions that surface. Um, the second question that comes up is whether or not you can have more than one YDD grant at a time. And the answer is yes, you may have more than one um, YDD grant. So that could be community investment, re-engagement, and future ready. 
The grants need to serve different programmatic and participant needs, and Future Ready grants are limited to just one. You may only have one Future Ready grant at a time. So if you have had a Future Ready grant um, in, this, in this current year or <clears throat> not, you are eligible to apply for another one, um, but that you will only be allowed to submit one application for a Future Ready grant. The grant period is um, the full biennium. So again, this differs from our current YD, excuse, our current future ready grants that are just for this current year because they were um, up, approved in the middle of, of the past biennium. So for the, the period for the next grants is the full two years. Our grants are reimbursement based and those reimbursements are dependent on first that executed grant agreement, then an approved project plan with an approved detailed budget. We'll talk later about that. Um, a submission in the EGAM system, so that is the where the payments are actually processed, and then in order for the grant managers to approve that, there also needs to then be this completed grant reports. So the reporting requirements for Future Ready for the 23-25 biennium, um, because there are because it's federal dollars, there are slightly different reporting requirements, but it still is the individual level data reports, as well as the expenditure reports telling us what you spent the funds on, the narrative reports explaining in detail the stories that that. Um, both support why you spent dollars where you did and also what they went for. And there may be some additional federal reporting requirements that surface um, and we'll be able to lead everybody through all of all of what is required for that. If you have other questions during the presentation, type them in the chat box for us to informally answer. And as I said at the beginning, after this presentation, you can submit questions to that single point of contact. That's the person who's listed on the first page of the RFA and that the answers to today's questions and to the questions submitted directly to the single point of contact will all be published on our YDD website. This presentation will be available as well, both the recording and the slide deck will all be available after the presentation. So as Cord touched on, the YDO mission, vision, and values are reflected in our RFAs and in the work that we do um, to support the, the grant initiatives. I want to draw your attention to our equity statement that due to Oregon's history of systemic racism and with an understanding that we continue to live with systems that perpetuate inequity, YDO works to eliminate the impact of these injustices on young people, and that is a guiding force in our RFA work. So, the, the Youth Development Oregon grant portfolio is extensive. Today, we are talking only about the Future Ready grants. And, um, and the, the, if you have questions about other grants that, <clears throat> um, other grants, there was a presentation that was delivered yesterday about re-engagement, and there will be a presentation tomorrow about community investments. And again, all of those will be available on our website. So a little bit of background about Future Ready Oregon. This is legislation that was passed in 2022, I believe Friday is our anniversary of it having been um, enacted for one year. And it was a $200 million investment split across multiple agencies. So heck, the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, Bully, the Bureau of of Labor and Industry and also Youth Development Oregon share those funds to address inequities specifically in the workforce system over about three years. And so what this means is that there is interagency work. There are grantees that have um, future ready grants from Tech and from Boley and from YDO or some combination thereof. The legislation originated in the Racial Justice Council Workforce Work Group and, and really is, it is from that that the future ready legislation prioritizes specific populations that we aim to serve. And so that includes low income communities, communities of color, individuals with disabilities, LGBTQ plus individuals, individuals impacted by the justice system, rural communities, and more. And that and more is really important when we think about Governor Kotex named priorities specifically around um, youth experiencing homelessness and, um, and the, the need for stabilization around that. So the, the purpose of the Future Ready Oregon Youth Grants is to take the funding that is available to YDO, and that's about $7 million for the 23-25 biennium, and use those dollars to fund the specific age range of 14 to 24 year olds 
each award um, will be in the range of $150,000 to $250,000. That's over the biennium. And that the, the intent of the initiative is to deliver workforce readiness services and activities. And we'll talk more about, about the eligible youth, um, but that we're looking at youth who are out of school and or unemployed and or involved in a re-engagement program. And that we need these youth to have access to training and placement in both sustainable and living wage career opportunities. And the way that that's done is through a combination of, first, essential employability skills training. And so that essential employability skills training is something that all of our, all of the Future Ready grantees will be delivering. And then in addition to that, grantees will choose from either paid work experiences or job placement and coaching or training resulting in an industry or employer recognized credential. And so there will be um, a, a mixing and matching, but everyone will be providing these essential employability skills training. So I'm gonna pause for a moment um, if there are any questions that have surfaced so far. And Paul, I'm, I think that you're handling the chat. If there's anything in there, certainly let us know. Absolutely. Thanks, Sally. Um, so yes, there was a question uh, that was sent to me um, and that we'll address here just quickly. So just a little bit about format. If you can, please post to the whole group. That would be great. We have a couple staff that are managing um, those questions. And so if you can just post to the whole group instead of just direct messaging, that would be very helpful. As well as we're using this as a record of the questions that are addressed or, and um, shared with us during the meeting. So the question that I've seen thus far is, uh, if you are a partner slash possible subgrantee for another CBO's proposal, would that prohibit you from also applying for one of the grants if the focus was different? And um, no, you can, you can be named Named as partners uh, in other grants uh, and work with other CBOs. Fact is, we do encourage that. Um, the, the big difference is that it has to be distinct and clear differences in services and the options being provided. So we don't want to do the double funding side of that. So with that, Sally, that's the only question I currently see. Uh, so I'll turn it back to you. And um, you're doing great on time. Um, just for everybody, we are uh, in working to try to keep this within about an hour uh, with the larger questions at the end so that we can address those. So Sally, back to you. Thanks, Paul. All right, talking a little bit about eligibility. So first, we want to talk about the entities that are eligible to apply for future ready funds. So we have nonprofit organizations, faith-based organizations, public benefit companies, and mutual benefit companies conducting business in Oregon, um, as well as the nine federally recognized tribes in Oregon, community colleges, counties or cities, um, YDD re-engagement system recipients and partners, as well as schools, school districts, um, <clears throat> and educational school districts that are in partnership with a CBO that provides direct services. So the, the first four are listed in blue because those must have an active registration with the Oregon Secretary of State's business registry that matches the organization type that's selected in the application. So if you are applying as a nonprofit, the name of the nonprofit that is listed in the application needs to be a, a named nonprofit that is listed on the Secretary of State's business registry. And so what we're looking for there is just to have um, uh, the match so that the funds are delivered to um, an active business in Oregon. In addition to that, because this is a federally funded grant for 2325, all applicants must have the universal entity identity. So while um, most will need to have the Secretary of State registration, all applicants for the Future Ready Grant will need to have that universal entity identifier, that UEI number. And that's a replacement of the DUNS number that was used in the past. So moving on to eligibility of the youth that this um, initiative intends to serve, again, ages 14 to 24, youth who are out of school and or out of work and or re-engaged, either in a YDD re-engagement program or other re-engagement program. So it does not have to be a currently funded YDD re-engagement program in order for an applicant to apply for the Future Ready grant for 2325. The priority populations that Future Ready legislation aims to serve are listed here. And the and this is this is legislatively stated. 
Um, <clears throat> and so although you may serve youth who are some or all of these, um, unlikely that they would be all of them, but um, that if they, that not every youth needs to be in a specific priority population in order to receive services in the future ready funding, but it is the intent of this legislation that these prior that these populations are prioritized and that active recruitment is done for and, and outreach is done for these populations, recognizing that some of these populations, um, that there's some sensitive information there and that it could be difficult to collect data on um, on all of the ways in which a person may identify. Um, Paul, are there any questions at this point on eligibility? I see that there's a couple things in the chat, but I haven't read the chat. Thank you, Sally. Sorry, I was working on answering some of the questions. Um, and if you're okay, I'll ask a couple of questions for you uh, regarding the eligibility for clarification. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the questions that came up is, did you mention that these youth do not have to be enrolled in school? If so, is that a requirement? I noted that out of school youth, out of work, youth as well as other re-engaged youth are eligible to receive funding. Is there anything that you would like to add to that question? No, I think that covers it. So um, these could be youth who um, potentially have a high school diploma or a GED so that they are no that they no longer need to be in school, that there would not be an expectation for them to be in school, but that they are actively seeking work, that they are trying to have um, access to a, a living wage career and that there would be training that a program would offer to them in that way. And then also that youth who are not in school, who don't have a high school diploma or GED, whether they are in a re-engagement program or not in a re-engagement program, they also would qualify for these services. Thank you. Uh, another question that uh, was addressed, um, <clears throat> will there be a prescribed essential excuse me, uh, will there be a prescribed essential employability skills curriculum required of all grantees? That's an excellent question. No, we do not have a specific curriculum. We recognize that there are um, a wide variety of, of needs among the youth that are served across the state and that there is not a, a one size fits all curriculum that we would require. Perfect, thank you. Um, the one question around um, the intended support services uh, and we're paid work experience, I'm gonna hold until later because I know that you're gonna be covering that in just a moment. Um, and then we have a few more questions coming in, but I'm gonna pause so that we can work on addressing them behind the scenes and then we'll come back at you with you uh, to answer some of these questions. Awesome. Yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit about scope of activities and requirements, um, and hopefully that'll answer some of those questions that are that are surfacing. So the again, the scope of activities is that this initiative is aiming to support youth who are out of school, unemployed, and or re-engaged, and that the goal is that there would be career exploration and skill development services with the very real intention of sustainable living wage career opportunities. We recognize there are youth who are working in um, low paying jobs and that it is only if they are offered higher paying jobs that they would give up those lower paying jobs in order in order to um, be able to move forward and have and have a living wage in the future. So that is where we are looking at the essential employability skills training that is not scripted, but the, those are the soft skills we know youth will need to have access to, um, how to write a resume, how to approach a potential employer, all of those soft skills, and that there are, there are um, stabilization elements that are involved in that as well. And then in addition to that, that there would be these paid work experiences or training resulting in a credential that is recognized either regionally um, by a set of employers or by a specific industry, but that it is a very targeted credential. Um, and then lastly, the job placement that's combined with job coaching. So there is a lot of overlap between the future ready grants and the um, longer existing YDD workforce readiness grants. And so we have a decision tree um, that um, my colleagues helped build as well. <clears throat> um, so what we're looking at is if you have a workforce program, and within your workforce program, you intend to use 
YDV grant funds to pay youth wages, then whether the program is existing or it's a new pilot program, Future Ready could be a good fit for that grant initiative and that application. If you don't intend to use YDD funds to pay youth wages, then that's where we have two different options. If the program is existing, currently in, in operation, then the Youth Workforce Readiness Grant Initiative is something to consider very seriously. If the program is a new or pilot program, and again, you don't intend to use YDD funds to pay youth wages, the Youth Solutions Grant is something for you to look into as well to see if that is a better fit for the work that you are intending to do. And again, this slide as long as well as the whole slide deck will be available after the presentation. So you don't have to memorize this or, or screenshot this. This will be available for you all afterwards. And then there is more detail here. So this, 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 and I know there's a lot of information on this slide. So the idea with this slide is to be able to show both um, what the individual grants cover and then also what they both cover. So looking at what they both cover here in the middle, both grants require detailed individual level data reporting, right? So this is, <clears throat> both of these grants are intended to, that, that individuals are served and that the services provided to those individuals are captured and that you can report on which youth received how many hours of services, um, wages, hours worked, um, and, and that there would be that level of, of granular data. Also, both Future Ready and our Youth Workforce Readiness Grants serve ages 14 to 24. So those are the same as well. And then this is um, this list kind of in the middle here around what some of the essential employability skills training would include, right? So resume development, interview skills, and other soft skills that you identify that the youth you serve need. In addition, one-on-one -on -one career coaching, counseling, and mentoring are covered in both of these grants. So distinctions for the Future Ready grants on the left here, the required activities are what I just listed, those, those essential employability skills, and then also either paid work or the specialized training that results in a credential or job placement. And then the other difference is that Future Ready funds are federal funds in the 23-25 biennium. So current Future Ready grantees um, have state general fund dollars. But in 23-25, because we will be using federal funds, then there will be federal reporting requirements. For the Youth Workforce Readiness Grants, there is less of a focus on measurable outcomes Right, so future ready, we can think about the measurable outcomes around hours worked and wages earned or credentials earned, um, et cetera. Youth workforce readiness is more focused on the needs that the youth have. And that's where we are looking at career exploration, workplace visits, entrepreneurship training, um, reentry services for youth who have been involved in the juvenile justice system pre-apprenticeship services and so here's like one of the one of the easier distinctions a pre-apprenticeship program where youth are learning about what might be available they may or may not be paid there might be simply a stipend that is awarded after they complete some number of hours in a pre-apprenticeship program that would be a great fit for the youth workforce readiness program in contrast in future ready we would expect that there would be a true apprenticeship that would result in um, uh, either what we would consider a paid work experience or that there could be some credential that's earned through the course of the apprenticeship. So when we consider the spectrum of work readiness, our youth workforce readiness grants are for the youth who are becoming ready to enter the workforce and future ready is for our youth who are ready to enter the workforce. So there are um, a few more supportive services um, that are really designed to increase stability for our youth that would be a good fit in the youth workforce readiness programs. And this is, again, where we're looking at those who have housing instability or who are experiencing homelessness, who are currently in or exiting from foster care and, and would require then additional support services. I'm going to turn off the pointer so you all don't have to look at that. All right, I'm gonna move on and, and, and we can answer questions in just a moment on those. The reporting requirements for 
um, for Future Ready are similar to the reporting requirements for other grants insofar as that they're the twice a year grantees will be submitting a narrative report and then quarterly, there would be both an expenditure report and also a data report, followed by at the end of each year, a, an annual data report. So quarterly reports are due within 30 days of the end of each quarter. Um, grantees need to address clarifying questions and make corrections in the time frame that's designated by the grant manager. And then once the reports are approved for the grant reimbursement claims, then um, then the grant manager is able to process the the approval for the funds to be um, to be released to the grantee. So our narrative report includes a description of activities, a description of challenges, success stories, progress, promising practices that have been developed, um, and those would be those would be due um, for quarters two, four, six, and eight. So every six months. The quarterly data report, um, again, is going to have individual level participant data, demographic data, and programmatic data. So that would that's where, um, if it's a paid work experience, that there would be details about which youth participated, for how many hours, what were the wages that that youth earned. That level of detail is what we're looking for. So I want to talk a little bit about, in the RFA, um, in addition to the, the, the information that you'll share about the program that you are proposing, that we also have a handful of non-scored requirements and that those include a uh, project title, so we know um, what, what it is you intend to do, a description of your organization, an executive summary of the proposed project, and then just the total budget amount and a budget narrative. And I'll speak more about that um, in a moment, but the um, there, there is not a detailed budget that is required at the time of application. We also ask for um, at least one letter of reference or support. And that letter of reference or support can come from a partner, um, from a number, number of other potential collaborators or um, community involved agencies, CBOs, et cetera. There are more details about that in the RFA, and there's also, you'll see on, on this slide that on the left-hand side, excuse me, on the right-hand side, um, that there are some attachments that are referenced. So in the RFA packet, you'll have um, about 30 pages of RFA, and then following that, the attachments. And so toward the end is a sample letter. So attachment H is the sample letter that will show you what we are hoping to learn from your potential partners, collaborators, or merely community supporters who can recognize and speak to the work that you have done as an organization and how your proposed project is a good fit for the community and meets the needs of the youth that you intend to serve. So for the budget, um, the way that the um, the way that the budget will be um, part of your application is you will simply indicate the total amount of funding that is requested, and then you'll write a budget narrative. And the budget narrative is intended to have a brief overview and a description of how the funds will be allocated. And this could be personnel, this could be youth wages, this could be direct supports to youth, this could be equipment that needs to be purchased or other items. In the budget narrative is where you're able to tell us, to some extent, what other funding this project would support. So if there is other funding that is paying for youth wages, for instance, and what you need is personnel and staff to supervise those youth, and that's what you would use the Future Ready grant for, that's where you would explain that in the budget narrative. You would say, here's how many dollars we are asking for, and of those dollars, here's how we intend to, to break them down, that we need to hire personnel. And, and the budget narrative is fairly brief and just allows you to tell the story of, of what you intend to do with the funds that are available if you're awarded. Then if you're conditionally awarded, you have um, time to then submit a detailed proposed budget that very clearly identifies the breakdown of how the funds will be used. And then through the grant negotiation period, we the grant manager and the conditionally awarded grantee will sit down together and talk through, okay, you're going to spend this on this. Does this work? Does this make sense? Is everybody good? And then once that's approved, then you then you move to the execution of the grant agreement. 
just a quick note again that disbursements are made quarterly um, following approval of, of the reports and the expenditure claims. A quick note on prohibited costs. Um, there are a handful of things that are not allowable. And that would be, you may not use these grant funds to purchase automobiles or real estate. Can't do anything that's illegal, either on the state or federal level. Uh, you may not use these funds for campaigning for office, religious instruction, or anything that falls outside of what you have told us you intend to do with this grant. And again, this is all in the RFA. So I'm going to pause there um, so that we can answer questions. I know I just delivered a lot of content. And so, um, Paul, if you could help me with the questions that have surfaced, that'd be great. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, so yes, I'll, I'm going to go back to some of the original questions that were submitted prior to this last section of the presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so Sally, you may want to add some more detail to those questions. So I'll pause after reading it and stating a, a general statement. So page eight of the RFA mentions that this initiative is intended to support services that include, but are not limited to paid work experience for program participants. The section above on the same page implies that paid work experiences for participants is optional. Can you please confirm whether paid work experiences are required or optional? I have a general statement of paid work experience is not required, but a primary focus of these funds. Wanted to verify that that was a correct statement and if you wanted to add any more detail. Yeah, it is true that paid work experiences are not required. Um, what is required for all grantees in Future Ready um, is delivery of the essential employability skills training. And then grantees have the option to provide either paid work experiences or training that results in an industry recognized credential or job placement that's that's um, combined with job coaching. So when we look at something like the credentialing, that can be credentialing, um, for example, to become um, certified or credentialed in heavy equipment usage. And so there may be a stipend that is paid to the youth for going through the, the training process. Um, and, and we support the, the paying of stipends for concrete things such as earning a credential. And that that would not be considered a paid work experience, even if the youth is paid. But it is the intention of Future Ready that this is very much focused on youth being trained and and positioned to be able to have living wage careers in, in the future as a result of what they were able to do in the future ready training or in the future ready um, coaching, job placement, and, and, and paid work experiences. So there, there are options in there, but it does not need to be a specific hourly wage paid experience in order to qualify for this grant. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you, Sally. For some reason, I'm all choked up today. <clears throat> um, Cord, if you don't mind uh, coming uh, on screen, this question, you might be able to provide some more detail. <clears throat> uh, no non-listed entities in the application. What is the verbiage to explain a county agency <clears throat> does not need to enter the SOS registration information? If you can address that question, I'm going to try to get my voice back. Sure. I <clears throat> Excuse me. I think uh, if, if I understand the question correctly, why, why would say a county agency not need to be registered in the Secretary of State Business Registry? And and um, the reason is that the business registry um, is is generally for businesses. Of course, um, nonprofit organizations register there as well. But city uh, and county governments are not registered in the state's business registry. Um, the other governmental entities most likely are not and are not required to be. The reason that we require, um, a, you know, a community-based organization, for example, to be in that registry is that when we would get to the stage of, of setting up the grant agreement, we need that entity to be a registered business within the state of Oregon. Um, so even an organization that, um, say, was based in Washington but was providing services in Oregon would need an Oregon business registry in order to be eligible to enter into that grant agreement. And so... Of course, Oregon city and county governments are not um, subject to that required registry uh, registration. Um, if I have missed something, I know Bethany is here and may have some clarification on that. So I want to give her a chance as well if I've missed anything. I don't think you missed anything, but how I read the question was 
was perhaps they're asking how they how they or what verbiage they should use on the application to explain that they're a county entity and therefore don't need to have a registration. I, that's how I understood the question. Oh, thank you, Bethany. That I think is a that's a more correct reading than I had. Um, I, I believe that where we ask you for the registry number, you can enter um, that you are not um, in the registry because of that. I think in, if you go into SM Apply, when, when you get to submitting an application, which I think we'll touch on later, um, at the stage where you would enter that number, there's instructions on how you should address it if you are not in the registry. Thank you, Cord and Bethany. Sorry, I should have had Bethany come on as well. Um, the teamwork makes right. the dream work. Thank you, Bethany. It does. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Sally, I'm going to have a question kind of back to you. Again, I'll, I'll let you know just the general statement that I responded, but um, add detail as needed. Are youth who are at risk who are still in school eligible? And um, my understanding is yes, but I want to see if you have any details to add to that. I, I don't have details to add to that. I think that um, it's going to be really dependent on the organization that is applying. So if it is a um, school or school district that is applying that has identified youth who are um, at risk um, of dropping out, that there that there does need to be some connection with a community-based organization that would be delivering those services. If, however, the grantee, um, the applicant, excuse me, if, if the applicant is a community-based organization, a nonprofit, a faith-based organization, et cetera, and they have access to these youth and have identified that these youth are at risk, um, then then that would would be a, a very simple thing that they would say, hey, we're we are a nonprofit and we work with youth um, through XYZ activities, and we've identified that these youth are at risk for um, leaving school prior to completing their diploma, and we deliver services that are um, aligned with the with the future ready goals around workforce readiness and that there is support for these youth to stay in school. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so continuing moving forward uh, and thank you. I see people still submitting questions, so appreciate that. Um, so future ready funding started late this year. Can we carry over our current enrollment and enrolled future ready youth into the new funding year? Um, so youth can be carried over to it, but as a note, uh, all 21-23 future ready funds must be expended by June 30, 2023. Um, the 23-25 funding cycle begins July 1, 2023. Uh, anything to add to that, Sally? No, just to reiterate that um, we acknowledge that the future ready funds weren't even, um, weren't even real funds until uh, March. 17th of 2022. And so we know that that all of the grants were quite late in getting funded. Um, and, and that it is a, a short time frame for our current future ready grantees to spend out, and that there isn't an extension beyond the June 30th deadline. But absolutely, the youth who are served can absolutely be, um, can continue to receive services if a future ready grant is awarded for the 2325 by NEM to that same organization. Awesome, thank you. Uh, another question is, are youth in juvenile detention education programs eligible? I believe the short answer is yes. Again, clarifying if there's any additional details. I see you shaking your head, so I'll keep moving. <laughs> or did you have something? I didn't, no. All right, perfect. Um, so uh, this one may require a little bit more detail as well. We are staff aged 18 through, through 24 that work rigorously to train and we've, even working with the local community college to get them credits for their training for our organization. Prior to us employing them, these staff members often do not have a job heading towards a career. Would this application only apply for new youth hires that fill this category, or would it also apply to who we already have hired in this category? Um, and then there's an additional question to that, but I'll stop there for a second. Um, I believe the answer is yes, funds can be used to support existing paid workforce training for youth. Funds can be used in a variety of workforce training programs meeting the requirements outlined in the RFA, not knowing the details specific to that. Anything you want to add to that? Solid? Okay. And then um, the second part of that question was also, is there a definition of a living wage? 
And I'm going to turn that over to Sally that's living that um, herself. <laughs> Yeah, no, that is an excellent question. Um, we do we do not have um, a state defined living wage term. It is a term that is um, discussed at length um, and and differs from differs across the region. So there are um, very strict requirements within Future Ready that the youth be paid no less than minimum wage for the region. Minimum wage um, has for a number of years changed on July first. And so you will need to check with um, with Bully Bureau of Labor and Industries, and there is an attachment at the very end of the Future Ready RFA that gives contact information at Bully and gives a map of the uh, state of Oregon to show what the minimum wage, um, what the what the boundaries are for different minimum wages. So there, the, because the minimum wage is not the same in the Portland metro area as it is in some of the more in some of the rural areas of Oregon. Um, and so future ready grantees are required to pay no less than hourly minimum wage. And there is a recognition that higher wages, higher than minimum wage, may be required for it to be considered a living wage. Thank you. Court, it looks like, uh, it looks like Court has it, yeah. Yeah. I did, yeah. I wanted to suggest that maybe we, um, in response to the question about a program that, if I understand correctly, is serving youth that the program is already um, is currently employing and providing services to um, and, and, and supporting in academics as well. I think we probably need to do some internal consultation and come back with the written answer on this one. Because my, my caution would be that, as I understand that the statute, we'd have to be careful about um, a program where these funds are basically being used to replace wages for youth who were employed already, uh, distinguishing that from youth who are not employed being provided with paid work experience. So we might need to do some additional clarification on that one. I just wanted to, to sort of jump in and suggest that we'll we'll get a clear answer. We may ask for, for additional information if we if we need it before we can answer that in the final response. But but I, I think we have to really parse that one a little bit more. And and I also what what came to mind for me with that question also is um the, the essential employability skills training, if those are if those um, activities are not being provided currently, but would be provided um, if the grant was awarded, that that could distinguish or differentiate it. Um, and and then some some amount of like, why why is this paid work experience? Um, like, in what ways is it is it supporting the youth in moving toward a, a living wage career? And or is there some credentialing? Is there something else that is happening other than just that, that youth are being paid to, that, that young people are being paid to do a job? Thank you. Um, and, and Cord, thank you for the, the clarification. That's a very good point on meeting that. Um, so the next question is, is there a minimum number of youth who have to be served? I believe the answer is no for that. But again, is there any detail that needs to be added? Okay, Sally, thank you. Um, is it beneficial or encouraged to include more than one letter of reference or support? Uh, it is required a minimum of one letter of reference is uh, uploaded as part of the application process, but applicants may upload other letters if they are desired to do so. Uh, you said out of school and or out of work. Does that mean youth in school but out of work are eligible? Again, they would be considered eligible as long as they were meeting the requirements of the grant. Um, and I think believe we've answered that a couple other uh, ways uh, throughout on that. Um, trying to keep track of which questions I've answered. Uh, reimbursements are quarterly. Is quarterly every six months versus every four months? Uh, our quarterly reporting cycle is on a three month cycle. Um, so four times a year that you would be reporting on it. Um, just as a note, you also can request reimbursements monthly if that is a, a need for your organization on it, but you're are required to report on that quarterly or three month cycle. Um, how do you obtain a universal entity number? Uh, Bethany or Cord might mo know more details on that. I'm um, wondering if Bethany, you don't mind coming on and addressing that question. To be honest, maybe Cord is a little bit better at this, but okay. uh, my assumption, just because I, I don't work directly with the grantees, but my assumption is that they would need to register with SAM.gov. Cord, would you like to? 
Sure. Yeah, that's correct. I believe there might be a link to the registration page in SM Apply where we ask you for that number. So you could indicate that you've applied for the number. I believe it does take some time to be issued one if you don't already have it. Um, but um, and we can also when we do the written response, we can include a link to that page as well. But um, yeah, you you go to sam.org. I believe is it or sam.gov, excuse me, um, sam.gov. And uh, that is that is um, essentially something you apply for online with the federal government. Perfect. Thank you for that. And yes, I believe there is a link in the SM Apply one as well. All right. Uh, so Sally, I'm going to come back to you for for this one. Uh, can we pay wages for a trainee during the classroom portion of the work experience training? To clarify, the participant would have an employer employee employer relationship during the classroom portion, so they technically meet the WEX definition. And we can come back. We can do some research on this as well. Let's let's circle back to that because I don't think I understand the question. I I think I think yes. Cord, do you understand the question? To yeah, I believe the question is: Can classroom instruction be considered a work experience if the other employer employee relationship requirements are are met? And and I do think we ought to um, discuss that one and come back with a response on it. Perfect. Thank you. Um... I. As a quick note, as a quick note, we do support wages being paid while credits are being awarded. You know, I think that might have been a question that is down on the list. So you, you must be reading ahead. I appreciate that. I'm not. Right. I just, <laughs> just guessed. That works. Um, all right. So it was mentioned that pre-apprenticeship was good for the youth workforce development grant, but if the pre-apprenticeship train and provides participants with certifications in a specific trade, would that be a good fit for a future ready organ? So I think it's a question around uh, the definitions between our CI workforce grant and future ready. So I'm not sure, Sally, if you want to address that now or. Yeah, it's all, I think that we, um, I don't know that there's a def, like a real strong definition of pre pre-apprenticeship versus apprenticeship, because what was just described sounds more like what I would call an apprenticeship. So if there's a credential that is awarded at the end, um, and if at the end of the training period, the youth is ready then to take the. Whoops, it looks like Sally may have frozen. Court, are you frozen? I am not. Um... Maybe we should pause for a second in case yeah, the connection just dropped off for a moment. See if she can. I'm going to actually, while she is pausing, um, and see if she can get back on. I'm Abe, do you mind signing on? We have an SM apply question. Do you mind coming on the screen? Hey, Abe, thanks for joining on. We have a question. It's a follow up to the, uh, the question that we had earlier with. Court and Bethany, it says that, that in the SOS number, it defaults to Oregon in the SM apply. Do you know what that might indicate? Abe, you're, you're muted. You're going to have to unmute. Thanks. I'd have to go in there and look. Uh, it can be, an, it's an easy fix. If it's defaulted to Oregon, I can make it so it doesn't do that. Um, but that Perfect. can be no issues. All right. So we will research that question. Uh, here in a moment, um, looking to see if Sally's back on. Sally, give me a thumbs up if you're back on. I'm All right, on. sounds good. <laughs> um, thank you for that. All right, so uh, we were uh, in the question. Are you ready? Are you signed back on? You ready to for me to readdress the question? You kind of yes, hit. yes, I'm All ready right. for it. All right. So it was mentioned that pre-apprenticeship was good for the youth workforce development grant, but if the pre-apprenticeship training or training, I'm assuming it's training and provides participants with certifications in a specific trade, would that be a good fit to future ready Oregon? I was frozen for a minute there because I answered that whole question to myself. It's all good. We didn't hear it though. We didn't hear it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so uh, as I understood that question, it sounds like it is actually an, what I would consider an apprenticeship program that could be a very good fit with future ready. And that a that if it if if a program results in an industry recognized credential and a youth who is ready to join the workforce, then that would be in alignment with the initiative of Future Ready. 
In contrast, a pre-apprenticeship program would be more around career exploration and that a person is, um, is, is thinking about or having exposure to a specific trade or career opportunity without the real readiness to join that career or industry. All right. Thank you. Um, so let's see, going back, making sure I'm getting the questions here. All right. So uh, a question um, of we have a current re-engagement grant, and I noticed that this grant requires that we serve a different population. But I also noticed that youth who are connected to re-engagement qualify for services under this grant. Can you clarify whether you served under our current re-engagement grant would be eligible to also be served under this grant? Um, I the response that I have currently is yes, re-engagement eligible youth can be served under these funds. It is obviously connected to that workforce training um, element as outlined in the RFA. Uh, Sally Airport, I don't know if you have other information to add to that. I don't. All right, sounds good. Um, next question is, is there a yearly maximum that can be spent on each participant per year? Um, and Sally, I believe the answer is no, but obviously it would have to be explained on how those uh, funds are being used uh, in your narrative and your reporting process. All right. Um, Job Corps is a federally funded program through the Department of Labor. We provide a pre-apprenticeship training, housing, food, medical services, supportive services. Can Job Corps apply for funding to connect with other agencies in Oregon to find applicants? Um, this was a question I know that came up yesterday in our uh, um, in our pre-application conference, and we are doing some research behind the scenes uh, with that. Bethany, I'm not sure if you have any response, additional response at this time for that. Okay, thank you. I'm highlighting it as a next step question that we will define in our Q&A. Um, I cannot find the range of grant amounts. Can you please provide with an appropriate range of what can be asked for in the budget? Sally, do you know that right offhand? I can look it up if need be. The range of the grant is one hundred fifty dollars to $250,000 over the biennium. Thank you. Uh, and then if you are a current future ready Oregon grantee, but think the youth workforce readiness grant may be a better fit for the population we are currently serving, can we continue to serve these youth with a workforce grant? So um, I think the general response is B is we would encourage you to apply to the RFA that best meets the program that you're currently offering uh, and uh, follow that process uh, as a note that um, information or the information session for the Community Investment Workforce Grant is tomorrow, uh, March 16th, at, beginning at 9 a.m., similar format to this with a different presenter on that. I do see a few more questions coming in, so I am going to pause for just a moment to do that and let people enter it in. I also want to recognize that the time is 9.59, so please feel free if you have had your questions answered, please feel free to uh, sign off. Sally's going to kind of do a wrap up here, and then we'll work on addressing those questions and stay on staff to address these questions as they are. Sally, I'll turn it back to you while we answer questions. Great. I am going to resume my screen sharing. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yep, good job, Sally. Awesome, awesome. yay. Um, all right, a couple of just quick comments about evaluation. All of this information is in the RFA, um, but, a, but a quick note, I wanna um, circle back to the question of serving youth who are um, in school, but out of work and when that would be appropriate. And so in the, in the evaluation questions, there is an opportunity for you to speak to the um, priority populations you're serving. And so this is where youth who are um, out of school or out of work or in a re-engagement program, if they are in school and are in the priority population, then that is, then those are youth who we would welcome um, an application for you to propose to serve them. Um, again, there will be questions on essential employability skills training and, and how you will deliver that, as well as which core activity you will provide. 
uh, we ask that you speak to the equity and access and how youth voice is incorporated in the project proposal that you've created. And then also um, the, the partners, collaborators, and also the community with, with, within which this program would be delivered. So um, there was information that was delivered yesterday and that we'll also speak about tomorrow um, about the ranking of applicants. Um, and so I'd ask you to refer to that just because it is more detailed and I don't want to rush through it. But there is a two-step process that is explained in the RFA. Um, and the, the intention of that two-step process is for there to be as much equity as possible in us awarding grants across the state. So there are there are regions across the state that have been identified and that if you um, if your business address does not reflect the region in which you are delivering services, you have the opportunity to share that information with us. Um, and but that we do we do really prioritize a distribution of funding across the state. And it is through the regional assignment of applications that we're able to do that. And then um, the final piece of information that I'd share is that the schedule is listed in the RFA and that I can speak to it really briefly here. Next week, we will have pre-application conferences, so similar to what we have done yesterday, today, and tomorrow, that are specific to the sovereign nations. And everyone is uh, invited to, to attend those as well. They will be um, held in succession on the 21st. So the three RFA info sessions will be delivered um, all together on March 21st, beginning at 8.30. Um, and then as the final reminder, any questions or requests for clarification are due to us by April 5th in order to be answered and posted by April 12th. Um, the request to, to change region is what I had touched on in that last slide, that if you provide services in a region that is outside your business address, you can notify us of that. If you if you provide services in many regions, you can also note that within the application. It gives you the opportunity to mark all of the counties in which you deliver services. Um, and again, the RFA is due on May 1st at 5 p.m. And we encourage you to not only refer to our technical assistance about how to navigate SM Apply, which is where the applications are held, um, and but we have so we have technical assistance that's available on our website, and um, and our single point of contact is available. So we really recommend that you apply before the deadline, so that if you have any questions, you have the opportunity to get those questions answered. And then our intent is that we will have uh, that, that we'll issue the notice of intent to award on or about the first of July, with the goal that these funds really be available right away um, and and for the full biennium. And that is um, that's all I have. So Paul, any any questions that we need to address this last final minute? Absolutely, thank you. Um, so just clarification on the sovereign nation specific uh, pre-application conference. Uh, the the entire conference starts at nine a.m. with re-engagement. Uh, Future Ready would then be followed on the same conference at nine thirty, and the community investment uh, as begins at ten. So we are trying to break that up per the RFA informations on that. Um, a couple of questions that came in. Uh, if we are a current, oh, excuse me, this was yes. Um, we partner with a local community college to provide GED services and currently give work readiness training. Would these funds be able to use, be used to pay for certification programs through the community college? Sally, do you mind addressing that, please? We may need more information on that. So if it is if it is a program for which students normally would be charged tuition at the community college, it I, I don't know that the funds could be applied in that way. Um, but there are certifications that community college students would be eligible to receive. Perfect. Thank you. Um, as a note, I did... Um, put the PDF version of this uh, presentation into the chat. So please download that. It'll also be on our website uh, towards the end of this week, early next, when we upload the um, video for this presentation as well. Uh, another question that came in, are, are youth eligible if they are currently incarcerated in local jails or state institutions? Um, the general answer I believe is yes. 
uh, for programming that meets the requirements outlined in this RFA. I'm not sure if there's other details. I see head nods from um, Cord and Sally, so thank you on that. Um, and then the last question that I have seen in chat um, is, uh, will insurance costs be allowed on a, an allowable charge for the grant? Um, yes, um, I'd also add a note to that, that I know that there's been many questions around the insurance, generally speaking. Cord and I are working with the Department of Justice to get some additional information published and um, out to grantees prior to the awarding process of this. Court, not sure if you wanna add more to that. Yeah, I was just gonna say that, um, yeah, thank you, Paul. We, um, we're we working on this guidance with, so some of you who have had future ready grants this, this time around, I know we've had a lot of, um, you know, for some folks, new types of insurance required or other challenges around obtaining insurance. Um, so we're working on just some general guidance for folks on the types of insurance we commonly require for these grants and answering questions like this, um, like how you might include insurance costs in the budget, if you have subcontractors, what are they required to carry, et cetera. Um, the goal is to have that document um, posted with other RFA info by the end of this month. So we, we want to have it out available for folks to review well before the application deadline. But we, we do see uh, some value in getting this info out before everyone applies so you know exactly what to expect. So um, that'll that'll be on the um, RFA pages. We'll get it posted with all the different RFAs as soon as we can. All right, wonderful. With that, it's not looking like we're having more questions come into chat. We'll hang uh, here on the call for just a minute. If you have a last minute question you'd like to submit via the chat, we'll work to address that. If not, at about 8.09, we will go ahead and end the meeting. Jessica and Melissa, not seeing any additional questions being submitted. I believe you can go ahead and, and have start dismissing people from the meeting that are not YDD staff. Thank you. I think that looks like everyone. I'm going to pause the recording. Sounds good. And Sally, I think you can stop sharing the screen.